begin. Okay, um, my name is Christina Gingora. <clears throat> I live in Fontana, California, and this is my husband. <laughs> Hello everyone, my name is Kareem Gungora. Um, I'm, I'm uh, a pleasure to be here this evening. But when I was a little kid, I was fascinated with a basketball player named Penny Hardaway. And so I adopted the nickname Penny as a kid. <laughs> and it, it opened me up to ridicule as well, because they'd be like, oh, you're worth a penny? And I'd, and it'd be like, no, I'd have to explain the story. But yeah, so that's the nickname that I could provide. Kareem's a little more out of the box. Um, actually, my biological name is actually Christian. So I'm actually, I was adopted into my family, so um, my mom grew up and always called me Christina, so I didn't find out my biological name until I was like in middle school, when you have to go sign papers oh, yeah. and all this. So um, it kind of just stuck. My mom preferred, my, my, uh, my adopted mother preferred Christina, so that's my name now. Yeah, we have three beautiful children. Um, actually, my, our eldest is my stepson, uh, Christina had a son before we got together. His name's Raymond, he's a freshman at Southern High School in Fontana. And then we have a uh, seven-year-old who's our more lively, resistant kind of child. Um, he goes to a dual immersion school, she's learning English and Spanish. And then I have my daughter, who's actually uh, has cerebral palsy and epilepsy, uh, was born at 33 weeks. And uh, we've been undergoing some challenges, but she's three years old. She's in school and she's uh, excelling, you know, far beyond what we, what we measured when, when she was born. It, it's pretty uh, difficult when you, when you think about the American experience and what media tells us about child development, birth. We had that with our second child, but our, but our, our daughter, that was not what it was. Um, I could vividly remember, and I always recall this like when I'm having hard days, uh, the doors that were swinging because of she was in labor. I didn't know whether she was alive or not because she had a placenta abruption. And I just remember the doors. Boom, boom, boom. You guys ever seen like, uh, what is Grey's it? Anatomy. Grey's Anatomy. Grey's Anatomy. Or e <laughs> ER type. You know, I, I, for me, I remember Doogie Howser as a kid. When there was a critical situation, you would see the doors. All the doctors running. And so that's, you know, an experience I recall vividly because it's associated with the birth of my child. A lot of trauma. Oh, tons. Yeah, significant. What was that like? Do you remember or were you under? Um, I was actually under. So the day previous of me having my daughter, um, I had children before, so I'm aware of like contractions and stuff. So I started to have a few contractions and I told my husband, I think, you know, I might be in labor. So he said, let's, well, let's just go to the hospital to check. Um, went to the hospital, I was admitted, had minor contractions, I had no pain. Um, they checked my, my bag, no leakage, nothing. Baby was fine, heart rate was like 152. So they just gave me some medication to stop the contractions and then they sent me home and told me if I had any other contractions to just um, come to the hospital. It didn't matter if it was minor, just come. So that same night they put me on complete bed rest. So I went home and I went straight to the room, fell asleep, and about 4 o'clock in the morning I started to have contractions again. So I told my husband and he's like, all right, you know, let's go. I just <coughs> went, off, went to the hospital still. I could walk, no pain, nothing. Um, we were admitted into bed to check, and um, initially they couldn't find my daughter's heartbeat, but they didn't say anything. If you're wearing like a hospital setting when they um, check on an ultrasound, usually they don't have the volume up right away. They're just kind of checking um, the ultrasound to see if there's a visual. So they checked that for a while, and the nurse couldn't find it, so she paged the doctor, and it was actually the doctor that was with me the night previous. So they eventually found a heartbeat and it was very, very minor and um, you could rarely hear it. It was down to like 60. So I didn't know exactly um, what was happening, just that my daughter was in distress and I needed to have an emergency C-section. So from the time that I actually was admitted to the hospital, for me being um, put under was under 10 minutes and because it was so severe, um, I wasn't given local anesthetic to um, take time to numb my body, rest my body. I was just completely knocked out. There was no epidural, there was no pain medication. So I woke up and it was about two hours after, an hour and a half, an hour and a half to two after. And I, I remember waking up in, um, in a cold room by myself. And um, there was maybe two or three nurses walking around and no baby no cries, nothing, um, nobody would tell me anything. 
Um, I just vividly remember going in and out, and that's when I found out that I, my placenta abruption, if you're not familiar with that, it's when the placenta detaches from the uterus. Well, mine completely ripped apart. So I was internally bleeding for we don't know how long, and under, I had a team working on myself as well as my daughter, and that's why my husband seen nurses going, nurses and doctors going in and out because they couldn't stop my bleeding. So I was at the verge of death. I was given blood transfusions, everything. Um, my body temperature when I was awake had dropped so significantly that um, I was completely gray. Um, they had to wrap me and wrap me to try to bring up my body temperature, and that's why I was just going in and out. And um, our daughter was actually resuscitated at birth. Um, 20 minutes it took, but she was resuscitated. And um, at this point, we didn't know exactly um, what were the terms of life for our daughter. Um, I woke up after they took us, took us, meet me in the room, and tried kind of explaining the situation. But my husband trying to keep me kind of under control and not freaking out because you know it's your child. Um, just said that you know she's not doing too well, but um, they're going to transfer her to another hospital that's going to be um, giving her treatment for um, the symptoms that she had. So we knew once she was transferred that. Um, when, you're, when the baby is um, detached from the placenta uterus, um, there's a lack of oxygen. So there's nothing for the child to breathe in terms of life. So um, she was just gasping for air in terms of life, couldn't um, take it in my blood. So what starts to fail in her terms, she, still had it, um, she had a hemorrhage in her brain, a fourth degree. And she bled and we didn't know if it was gonna stop or continuously bleed. So um, I was left in the hospital, and I just told him, "Gold, our daughter, I'm okay." So he went with her. Um, I discharged myself two days after, just because it was driving me completely crazy, not knowing anything. And as a mother, we have this instinct that you know we just need to be there. We know we need to be there. So I was discharged. I mean, I discharged myself. My husband took me there, and I remember the first time that I met my daughter. Um, there was neurologists, there was so many physicians that were there. Um, and there was one doctor that I can't, I can't remember his name, but he had like reddish orange hair. And I had just met this doctor. Mind you, I had just met my daughter maybe hours before and they had told us that they needed to talk to us about terms of life for her because they didn't think she was going to make it through the night. And I remember him telling me that, you know, sitting us down, talking about her situation, that um, brain damage, um, that she could be possibly a complete vegetable, that she wouldn't recognize us, that she wouldn't be able to talk, walk, nothing, again. And that um, she would probably stop breathing on her own and whatnot that night. Um, and he knew that we had two sons prior, probably because he spoke to my husband, you know, and he had told us that, um, we needed to take consideration because we had two boys and this, this, our child, our daughter, would be a burden to our life, to our, life, to our son's life and stuff. And I just completely broke down and that was my moment of just breaking down because I didn't know what this was going to lead us to and I knew that she was my daughter and it didn't matter and I believed what we always say is that there's a, there's a doctor's will and there's God's will. So we kept faith, and I just remember telling my husband, get him out of here, I don't want to see him again. I want somebody else, somebody else. I don't want to talk to him. I didn't, we didn't see him. So um, we had family and friends come and stuff, but I mean, my memory was very like wish-washy because my priority was her and knowing that, you know, what, I need to do whatever I needed to be strong for her. Um, so they told us that they needed to talk to us. So we were going to be sent to a conference room with like five physicians and they were going to tell us the results from her MRIs and x-rays and stuff from the bleeding. So we sat down, we were taken into a room, we sat down and I remember them telling us that um, her bleeding had stopped, but that the layers of the brain, there's four layers and her, her bleeding was so bad that it went to, like, basically to the core of her, her brain. So it <coughs> led to the fourth degree. So what happens is that there's two organs in your body that do not recover, and that is your brain and your heart. So if you bleed, what happens over time is basically that blood is, I don't know, I like to say like making more easy, eating that brain matter. So that brain matter is being 
taken out of the body over time. So you kind of just have to wait to see what, what the child or the person is going to be like. So um, she was on high blood pressure medication, everything else. And um, she wasn't breathing on her own. She was, had, had a, C, a CPAP, so it was a device that helped her with the oxygen level and stuff like that. She couldn't breathe. Um, so they told us that they thought our daughter had about a couple more hours, that we needed to do whatever we needed to do to feel comfortable and um, in terms of life. If she was to start breathing, that we would either bag her, um, CPR, stuff like that. So as a mother, you can imagine like me feeling um, very closed in, like everything was just coming down on me. Um, I broke down. I broke down completely, and I'm more um, introverted and don't really like to be in the front scale. That's more him, <laughs> so I let him do that. Um, but um, of course, my husband was like there for a bit, but he, I used him as my like my 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 <coughs> strength and everything, and he's always been so positive with everything. I mean, you can slap him, and he'd be like. It's okay. Like he's just—he doesn't. There's. So, I always tell him there's something about him that he just doesn't take anything. Back. He always thinks about the positive of something. So he just, you know, reinformed me that again, doctors uh, will and there's gods, and we put our faith first and prayed and prayed and prayed and uh, miraculously that night she started breathing on her own. She stopped um, medications were going slowly going off. Um, Within like a month's time, um, she was A-OK. -okay. She didn't need all that, the stuff that she needed. Her hearing was fine. Her vision was fine. Um, we knew that there's still going to be little obstacles in the long run. But for me, it was, it was OK. Like, she was strong enough. She had the will. So she's telling us, you know, like, we're going to do this. So we get faith. And today, she is just turned three. Um, she's rambunctious. She's stubborn. <laughs> She is a little crazy one. She is our crazy child just because she has a bunch of energy. But um, like he said, she is epileptic. And we're just battling seizures right now, a little bit of insomnia, a lot of insomnia. Um, and her cerebral palsy, which is just basically um, trauma to the brain. Um, there's no specific um, definition for that. It can range from mild to severe. She has mild. She's walking. Um, speech is a little bit behind, but she understands her comprehension is fine and everything else. So we're just now taking it like we did before, one day at a time, and just going through life like this now. So um, traditionally, growing up, we viewed people with disabilities as disabled. Mm -hmm. We call them disabled, disabled, disabled. But what you actually learn is if you take off your glasses, I can't see. I'm disabled too. <laughs> if you have your glasses, I don't know how severe your vision is. Um, but what it comes down to is we all have particular needs. It's either if we have ADHD, we have autism, um, we have other handicaps. All we need is just that little help. Um, and, and once you have supply that help, you see these people excel. And you have people who have, who have Down syndrome owning companies. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and these are things that were not heard of. You know, there's stories of, of autism kids running car washes mm -hmm. because of the type of structure that is in place. Um, so it's really redefining that, looking at from a different perspective. And um, honestly, just, just being abrasive of it, because there was a lot of resistance. You know, I know growing up, we were always like, oh, they're on the, that bus. They're on that, that class. Um, and so now I think education is trying to catch up. Uh, but I think in society, I, I think we probably could do a little bit more. Absolutely. That's really powerful. Yeah. Yeah, because I, I, I do not agree, and we both don't agree with the word disabled. Mm -hmm. um, we've always said that she's able. And our job as parents, teachers, everything, for, we're the first for her to tell her that, challenge her, you know? Um, ultimately, when she started, she just started preschool, and she started a program, it's a separate program, it's a special educational program, um, that kids with um, disadvantages, I'd say, um, are able to go and have social skills, interact, and be in a different, um, different place than other than home or therapies mm -hmm. because she does she has a lot she has two um, physical therapy appointments a week two occupational therapies a week two speech appointments a week she has an in-house teacher that has come since she was three months old once a week um, neurologist neurosurgeon you're talking about ophthalmology these are like the regular routine so when I was talking I don't know if anybody heard earlier like um, my nursing is on hold because I'm home now 
I'm home because she is my responsibility and she is my, my, it's my job. My, I have to do everything for her. Um, but going back to, to disabled and stuff like that is we want to challenge her and her going into um, this type of like special education program, it was harder on me because I felt like she can't speak. And my fear is her being somewhere where something somebody's hurting her or somebody's telling her something or something's happening, she's not able to communicate that to me. And I understand her because she speaks a lot of body language and I'm, and I'm with her 24-7. Then I'm like, oh, she's, she's saying this. And I'm like, what did she say? I'm like, oh, she means this. You know, but um, somebody outside of the home doesn't understand that. So I, I um, that was something that was challenging for myself. But we're coming back to speaking to my husband. And it's true, like, if we don't allow... Um, children to be challenged, then we're not giving them fair opportunity. You know, we're 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 separating them and telling them that they're disabled, that they can't. Mm -hmm. So um, she's like I said, she's exceeding, and she absolutely loves it. The first day was hard; she cried. The second day, I cried. The third day, she was like, "Bye," and I cried. And like, she left me. She's fine. And I was like, "See, that's all she did." I'm like, "Boo, why did she cry?" But um, but she was like, "Bye," and when I come pick her up, she's like, "Mom, okay." Let's go. Let's go. She grabs her backpack and she's happy. Yeah. You know. She's happy. But I think it's our responsibility that we've had that experience to show that mm -hmm. um, any opportunity I get, I'm an advocate for kids with special needs. Yeah. I've been up, down, left, and around. The system's broken. We need to repair it. I'm educated, but even I don't know the system to the T. So any chance we get, oh, oh yeah, yeah, definitely. We actually, um, my our daughter was in Loma Linda um, Medical Center, and. We met so many parents throughout our journey and picking back on each other and our experiences and whatnot kept us like going forward and hope and stuff too. And we got together with another um, parent, um, couple that we actually met. Going into the NIC room, you have to scrub. So you have to completely scrub everything before you go inside. And we met them because we were new to this and they were explaining things to us and telling us, you know, just keep faith. And, hearing their story because they had twins and they had lost one at birth and one was in the NICU and stuff. So we started to kind of piggyback on each other and, and talk to physicians and everybody else and nurse practitioners and they all knew us on the floor because we were the, the couple with the million questions. <laughs> they yeah. probably dreaded coming to our room because they were like, all right, I would get my notebook, he would get his notebook, we're like, what's this, what's that, why is this happening? And they're just like, okay, we will be back. We can only answer so many questions, but um, we started to like, familiarize our, our, ourselves with people because we stood at Ronald McDonald and we're like, you know what, like, there needs to be something that these parents can come together and we can talk and, 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 and tell each other, you know, things that are happening or how we're feeling because a lot of times you can't, like, you can connect to your nurses and stuff, but on a parent level it's a little bit different, you know, they're kind of going through the same thing and we um, started the, the first NICU um, parent advisory group. So that was exciting. So um, I held my first class like maybe a year after our daughter was born. And, and it was nice. It was nice to just sit down. And we started getting nurse practitioners, nurses, doctors who wanted to attend, who wanted to go, who opened up their homes for us to hold these meetings. And you know, by no judgment and questions and stuff like that. So we did that like a year after. And like he said, our story, it, we always like, like I said, I'm extroverted, I mean introverted, I don't really, I mean, really say much, but so this story, because it gets to me, because yeah. this has opened me up so much. This has made me want to advocate so much more, and I'm always like, why isn't there this type of program for these kids here? Why don't we have this? Why don't we have that? Because it's like, you familiarize yourself with the story, and you want to share. That's a very good question. I learned it in, in elementary when I talked back to my teacher because she was treating me improperly. I just, I was an outspoken child. My name was abnormal, so, you know, I would get picked on by kids, and so um, I had issues growing up, you know. But I think it was common growing up as a minority um, during those times that their, their, their first reaction was to kick you out of class or to suspend you. Um, so there was actually a time I got suspended. And it was for throwing rocks in a puddle. Like they were, they were like, oh, you're creating a nuisance, you're gonna harm people. And so I actually went to my mom and I said, mom, you know, I, they're treating me unfairly. I and my mom, uh, real quick fact, my family's from the, uh, Belize, which is in Central America. It's a Caribbean type place. My mom's the last of 21 kids. 
So um, she grew up a little spoiled, <laughs> very outspoken. And so when I enabled, when I told her this story, she was just like, oh no, we're going to go. <laughs> that's, that's, the, that's how she approaches it. Oh no, we're going to go handle this. So it was at that time that I knew I had a voice. I think it was like third, second or third grade, that my voice had something to it. Yeah. Right? That if I spoke up, I had someone who had my back. And essentially, when you look at your place in this world, you're always looking at who's going to be behind you when you're rallying the charge. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, that's a moment that I could take back. I, I'll never forget that because my best friend um, was there, and he's African-American. So we both got suspended. And he was the only African-American kid in this class. And um, we didn't throw anything racial, but we said, hey, like, maybe there could have been an alternative punishment. Maybe we could have picked up trash or something, but they automatically went to, maybe you should spend it for three days, go to the local continuation school with the other students that are misbehaving. So uh, thankfully, the policies have changed nowadays. There's more discussion in regards to that back then, it was like easily, you're done, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but now that we have more people who have support, that have those infrastructure, those systems, they have the education, um, advocacy, you know, is, is leading the way now. But that, that was that moment. I don't know if you want to share a time. I don't know. I can't really. I think for me, it was my daughter. Yeah. I, I truly believe that. I feel like that just made me a better person, mm -hmm. better mother, better, better wife, just all together. Made me, it was so negative and it was so traumatizing, but it made me so much look at life like it was more mm -hmm. than what it was before and there's so much more that we have to do. Yeah. We're involved in community service. So I was going to school at the time. You're in school, right? Yeah. Yeah. So we, I remember we, we um, I interviewed for uh, community service for after school programs in the city, and I went to interview for um, elementary. So I was like, I'm going to work with elementary kids, and I was still in school. And um, the person that interviewed me was like, wow, like, um, that's when I was going to school for my nursing. So she's like, I think that um, you would do really good with uh, middle school kids. And I didn't even know they had like that program. And I was barely like 18, 19, I don't remember. Um, so I was like, okay, didn't really want to. I was kind of nervous, but she's like, yeah, you know, you do really good at this school with these people. I'm like, all right. So one of them was him. <laughs> And another girl, I actually you knew I went to high school with her young brother, and I'm like, that name looks familiar. So we um, had a, what's it, or, uh, orientation, and I remember, because he always tells me, he looks at the, the, the sheet and it has a name, because he's like the in-house supervisor at the time. He wasn't the full thing yet. And he looks at my <laughs> no, name, he looks at my name, and he's like, little the name, he's like, wow, he's like, Christina Hernandez? And he's like, it's a really nice name. She's probably really bicep. And I remember him saying this. I was like, oh, okay. And he's like, he was like, walks in like this white girl with like things. I was like, she's totally different. What I mean? I'm like, okay. So he told um, another guy that he worked with. He's like, wow, she's really pretty. And the the guy that was with him was like, oh, she's all right. She's all right. So this is actually on our wedding video because he talks about this. You're crazy. You're crazy. He's like, I'm gonna talk to her. So uh. Um, we worked at the facility, and I remember him like trying to be a smart aleck about something, and I kind of like smart aleck back to him, and then we kind of just started like talking here and there at work, nothing more than that. And then he had called me one day, and he's like, "Hey, he's like, do you want to go watch a movie?" I'm gonna tell him the whole story. You want to go watch a movie? Oh, what I'm like, I was like, "Oh, okay." And mind you, I hadn't dated like at all for years. Yeah, he's embarrassed now. <laughs> so I'm like, "All right, okay." I thought he was handsome. But I didn't say nothing. I'm like, okay. So, when on our first day, we went to a movie. What movie was it? Was big mama so, uh, we go and watch the movie, and then he, he's always been one that he's just like, not just on his phone, but he's just like, his mind's always right. Now that I've been with him for over 10 years, now I understand. But uh, he's just like, wants to do everything at once. I'm like, hey, you know, so now, whatever, we're talking, and then um, he ends up going home and telling his best friend, no, I, I really like her, and blah, 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 and that. And, Oh, I don't know, and he's like, yeah, go, go, go. So for like two weeks, every day, it was either breakfast, lunch, dinner, golfing, it was movies, it was everything. Um, so then later, let's move, like fast forward like three, four, five years, 
I found out that my knee, he told me that he had not been in a relationship for a while. He was like just out of a relationship for like four months or something. And actually, he was talking to somebody, like just friends, and talking to another somebody, just friends. And he's like, they're like, hey, well, them two got together and said, you know what? Let's go, let's go catch him. Let's go say the take him to the movies. Hey, meet me at the movie. So one girl says, hey, Cream, let, let's go watch a movie, meet me over here, blah, blah. He's like, all right, whatever. And he goes to the movie and they're both sitting together, like, hey, Cream. It's always funny to say because everybody thinks that. Well, sometimes when you look at us or our story, it's like, wow, these are perfect years. I'm like, no, it took a lot to get yeah. to this point. Mm -hmm. It takes a lot of growth. It takes a lot of understanding <laughs> and individualism. And <laughs> it's important to understand the level of growth that's needed with, with relationships, whether yeah. it's your companion, it's someone you meet off the street, your classmates. Um, those relationships are, are really contingent on how much you engage and interact with each other and what type of interaction. Uh, when we got married, one of the key things that was told to us is what's your love language, yeah. right? Like, how do you communicate with love? I learned my <laughs> seven-year-old likes little trinkets, so whenever we go to the store, he knows that I love him a lot and if I buy him a little Lego, right? Oh, the smallest The Lego. smallest, it could be two, three bucks, but it's like, oh my God, Dad, you love me like no other in the world. <laughs> my wife likes to spend one-on-one -on -one time with me. And that's her language. And so it's understanding that, even in your friendships, like what do your friendships usually want? Like I have a best friend um, who comes around probably like once a week um, and, and vents to me. And, he, and sometimes he's having issues with his, his son or his, his uh, son's mother. And, and that's how our relationship is, you know? And it's, and it's understanding that, being aware of that, mm -hmm. and, and being really uh, accessible. So you could be that good friend or that good companion. And so I guess for me, I, I, I've been able to understand that with a lot of my relationships that I have, especially with my wife, because it's hard, you know. Um, I... So it started early, actually. It started um, in, in high school. I was a varsity uh, basketball player, and my coach would, uh, would tell us, you're going to go feed the homeless at a local, I don't know if you know, but Fontana's right to San Bernardino. If you know San Bernardino, very impoverished, high crime very, very low, low, low income, a lot of issues. So we'd always go there, St. Mary's Mercy Center, and Thanksgiving, Christmas, and then um, we would do things like that. So that was kind of my calling. And there was a Boys and Girls Club that was local, and uh, I played basketball as a kid, so I would help kids play basketball. I would coach them in their little teams, and, and that was kind of my calling. You know, like, oh, you could be, that, that, maybe that's another instance where I said, hey, I could change a kid's life, you know, and that was like 14, 15. So. Yeah, I, I think a lot of it reverts back to my culture. Um, I had the opportunity um, to go back to my parents' country, it's a third world country, and so that connectivity with my culture, my roots, really brought me to a level of understanding like, man, where I come from and where I should be, I owe a lot to my ancestors, I owe a lot to my parents, and I, I owe a lot to my community as a whole because I had an understanding that in my culture, we look out for each other. Whether you're the poorest person, I mean, a lot of cultures are like that, but my culture lives day to day. So um, sometimes families come together, they eat meals together, might be the only meal they eat that week, but that's kind of the, the level of understanding I had of who I was as an individual. So when I came back to the States, um, that was my reality, like, hey, if we can survive together, <laughs> you know, one day at a time, we're gonna be in a good place. So ideally, um, that, that shaped it all, I would say. And my mom was always taking people in off the street. All my friends would come in, they would eat at my house. My dad would hate it, but my, but my mom's heart was just so open and, and, and willing to help. We had families move in and stay with us. Families of like six, seven people stay with us. Oh, you can stay with us for a month, we'll, we'll help you out. Yeah. Oh, who's, 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 who are we helping this month, you know? Yeah. And um, I don't know, I guess for my parents and for the way they, raised us was like service of others is like the biggest gift you could provide. See, I, I don't like to say politician because I feel more of a public servant. I feel like politicians is what you see at the national level mm -hmm. when they can't figure out how to get along. I feel like when you're in the element of public service, you're looking at more avenues where we connect and where we can work together. Um, and, and that's where I like to be at. I, I think of the world as intersections, mm -hmm. intersectionalities, and you look at where we're all going. Like, you could be wanting to buy a car. I can know a car salesman. 
I can connect you to, and that gives you a better improved quality of life to a certain extent. So when I look at the elements of public service, I look at, I look at it in those perspectives, perspectives as well. Uh, right now I'm working on a bill called SB 26. It's actually a bill that's gonna restrict sex offenders from entering school campuses. Um, you would think like, oh, that should be a given, but it's not a given. <laughs> um, it, it's a serious issue, and when you think about the safety of our communities and of our schools, um, it's something that I hold very dear because we have kids. Uh, and it's thinking about that from a broader scale. Um, it's not looking at like who's a Democrat, who's a Republican, who's independent. It's looking at what's right and what's just, you know. And so for me, um, that's where I view my role in the community as a whole, uh, as a person of public service. It's kind of like how Caesar says, you know, you know that that, that the via public service is like the goal of it, you know. And that's where I guess I see myself. Um, the, the rules of radicals, it's actually some of Caesar's um, ideologies of community organizing. And there's different steps you take, right? There's some crazy steps that are kind of really more radical, and then there's ones that are like, oh, I should be doing this. So, uh, in following Caesar's um, actual adventure, one of the things that constantly miss is that the way he was able to really uh, capture the community was because he, he brought together different communities, right? The Filipinos and the Mexicans were not getting along. They were at war, they, were, they weren't at war, but they, were, they disliked each other. He found the opportunity to, to get together with this guy named Larry Ilyong. And when they came together, that's when the Delano strike uh, was a little more successful, and that's where um, you kind of have the birth of the UFW. Um, and you also had Delos Huerta involved in that. I think her as a woman, she's kind of not as, as heralded because she was more behind the scenes. Uh, but she was a, a very instrumental part in that process. And a quick aside, um, I actually got a school named at Dolores Huerta in my community uh, because of her value and what I know she would bring to young boys and girls, regardless of their culture and their, and their ethnicity, because um, her story is, is, is a beautiful tale. And, what, and she's 88, 87, <coughs> and she hasn't stopped. Mm -hmm. She's still fighting for, we named a school after them, um, I sit on the school site council. My son goes there. It's a it's a bilingual school, and um, like I said, like a public service. You look at those elements. You look at where you can apply yourself, where your voice can be heard, and um, that's kind of where Caesar has changed my life mm -hmm. a little bit. And that's ideally where we're at now. Uh, yesterday evening, I was sharing with you. I was at an event with John Chang, and there was 20 students. It's a public policy school, UCR. 20 students were like, I want to be a senator. I want to be a congressman. I want to be the mayor of my town. And there's room for everyone to be involved. One of the things I shared with uh, Sharon was that um, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. And what that means is if you have something that's important to you um, and you're not at that table discussion to where it's relative to you, that could be lost and your voice could be lost too. When it comes down to... Um, What's big right now? Healthcare, right? Uh, pre-existing conditions. If people that have pre-existing conditions are not advocating or speaking for this element in a big legis uh, legislation, they're going to be lost, you know. And, and those, and those are the things you have to look at. The movements when you have the, the Americans with Disabilities Act movement, you have the UFW movement, you have the Civil Rights Movement. These people were disadvantaged. They were, behind, you know, put up against the wall, and they had to fight. And so. Well, that's something that I think is, is important as well. So to, to, to scale it back, um, I have my, ma my bachelor's degree in English from the University of California, Riverside. My master's in management from the University of Redlands. Uh, full time, I work for the county of Riverside, which is one of the biggest, uh, it's actually the sixth biggest county in the nation. Um, and I'm a communication specialist. So my job is to communicate internally. We have 24,000 employees. So it's taken a long, long road to get here. You know, I'm 29 years old. I'm not done learning, I'm not done, done educating myself, but I've done a lot to, to, to be who I am today mm -hmm. and, and to kind of equip myself with the tools necessary. Um, and, and I think it's important for me when I see people older than me that come down and say, hey, we see what you're doing, uh, we want to help you. Um, it's really astonishing. I always tell you, huh? Mm -hmm. Like, how, why do these people believe in me? Why do they think that I'm of substance? Um, and I, I think it's a lot of the times because I genuinely care. Yeah. This is where change occurs, right? No matter what you look like, sound like, 
I mean, my name's Karim Gambora. You don't know what you're getting in when that, somebody comes in the room. I work in HR now, and I always tell them, like, what did you guys think you were going to get? They're like, someone African-American, someone Muslim, but we didn't think we were going to get a Latino. <laughs> so it's interesting to look at that. Like, what is your uniqueness? What do you provide to the world or to your community? You know, what is within you and around you that you can apply yourself? And essentially, that's what I've been able to do in my own community. Um, right now, uh, I'm the chairman of a county committee, uh, which is under the superintendent of schools. And I also served a year on our planning commission. Um, and I'm also the president of our local club, local democratic club. Um, and just do a lot of different things. Um, I definitely. Because I think it's important. Um, being a, in public service, you're gone from your family a lot. A lot of the time, she's carrying all of the load some of the load, mm -hmm. if not, you know, 100% of the load. Um, and one of the things that I told myself was that uh, it's important for us to be in this journey together because as we're growing and developing, it's essential that we understand how we're growing and developing together. So that's where <coughs> couples eventually disconnect, right? One of you end up going in a different path, want to go to Hollywood, the other one wants to go and stay Cal State Florida. Yeah, <laughs> for me, you know. I'm going to be participating in a local special election uh, because I feel like education is transformative. I know you guys are in <coughs> college right now. I was in your seat soon. I'm still paying those student loans. I'm mad at Sally Mae. I'm mad at Navigant. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but I think that if we educate and we create communities that uh, really channel from cradle to career, create pathways for um, employment, we could transform our, 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 our nation, mm -hmm. you know? I really do think that. And I think sometimes we don't capture that. I think sometimes we look at the negative, the negative, the negative. Mm -hmm. You know, we say, oh, he says this about me. And it's really not taking things personal. And it's looking at our commonalities as opposed to what separates us. I know that class is about to end in five minutes, but I want to ask them if they have any questions for you. Because we did not cover all the questions I have for you, oh. but we will. <laughs> Part two? It's got deep. <laughs> yes? You kept on repeating the word community, and I just want to really, what's your definition of community? My definition of community would have to be the different existing um, individuals in the community and how they connect to each other. Um, it's, it's really broad because you look at the systems at play. You look at the business community, you look at the educational community, you look at the culture, and how, how, how all that play interweaves with the other. Um, so when I refer to that, I'm, I'm really talking about the different aspects of the system of a community. <laughs> well, I have a lighter question, just because I'm curious. Do you think that um, the, the city you were raised in had something to do with the way that you're looking at everything now? Because I, I know you said you were from Fontana, and I'm, I don't really know much about Fontana, uh, but do you think like if you were to live like somewhere else, like Orange County, like Southern County, would that be affected your uprising? I, I think so, essentially, because Fontana, um, to give you a really quick history, was the, the, the home base of the KKK mm -hmm. and Hell's Angels. So when you look at these far right-leaning organizations um, and how the, it's come to today, um, I've kind of found myself in Fontana, and that's essentially why we didn't leave. You know, for me, educated, um, I have my degrees, I, I could be elsewhere, but I felt that my village helped me in Fontana, so I'm going to do what I can to help people come rise up um, in my community. So, yeah. Definitely. It's a good question. Is that why you're going to stay in your community too? Yeah. <laughs> what city? Tustin. Tustin. That's an interesting place. Uh, I went to Ir Concordia University for two years, so I got very familiar with this area. So if you need any kind of connections or something, yeah. reach out to me. You have the autonomy to how you receive things, mm -hmm. interpret it, and respond to it. So if something negative is happening to you, like the crisis we had, you could either mope, cry, willow, or you could actually rise, channel your courage, and say, we're gonna get through this together, one day at a time, one hour, one minute, one second. Um, and, and that's essentially why this country is so great, because we've always found ways to come together. You know, and it's looking at those things that impact us, and looking at